Welcome everyone. My name is Tim Fisher from Tonkin and Taylor, the, one of the Earthquake Commission's engineering advisors. Welcome to this Land Hub uh, presentation which gives an overview of increased flooding vulnerability. In this uh, presentation I want to introduce to you uh, the concepts around increased flooding vulnerability, uh, talk about the criteria and assessment methods that we use and there'll be some time at the end for questions. Uh, we're here because of the land damage that's caught, been caused by the Canterbury earthquake sequence. Feel free, come to the front row. The, the figure on the screen uh, shows the earthquake sequence. Uh, there were four major earthquake, earthquakes that we consider as uh, in terms of the increased flood vulnerability, but there were many other aftershocks. In terms of what Earthquake Commission cover, it's important in the context of increased flood vulnerability. They cover the, la the lands. The, the land that the building is situated on, the land that's within eight metres of the building and appurtenant structures, and the main access within 60 metres of the dwelling. They also cover all bridges and culverts located in the above areas. They also cover retaining walls within 60 metres of the building and supporting the building or land in the insured areas. The Canterbury earthquake sequence uh, has resulted in new forms of land damage that haven't previously been considered. Increased flooding vulnerability and increased liquefaction vulnerability are forms of land damage that haven't um, been uh, assessed or, uh, or insurance um, identified for. So this is, these forms of land damage are new forms of land damage that haven't been tried or haven't been identified and assessed anywhere in the world before. Increased flood vulnerability. Christchurch, in terms of its context, has always been at risk of flooding, but due to land subsidence, in some areas both the extent and depth of flooding has changed. Increased flood vulnerability. IFE is a physical change to the residential land as a result of an earthquake which adversely affects the uses and amenities by increasing the vulnerability of that land to flooding events. Only changes to the insured land, which I showed you in that previous slide, that res result from that land becoming more vulnerable to flooding as a direct result of the earthquake are covered by the Earthquake Commission. Flooding that occurred uh, prior to the earthquake sequence or increases in flooding due to changes in off-site drainage due to the earthquake are not covered by the Earthquake Commission. There are a number of specific criteria to be met for increased flood vulnerability to be confirmed. In terms of the flooding that we uh, are considering, uh, there are a number of forms of flooding. There's tidal flooding, as shown in the top figure, where for an extreme high tide, water encroaches onto the land. The second figure shows pluvial flooding, which is caused by rainfall onto the land and accumulating in overland flow paths and flowing towards the rivers. The third and lowest of the diagram shows fluvial flooding, which is the flooding that occurs in or around rivers due to the accumulation of runoff in the rivers overtopping the banks and spreading onto the land. Increased, increased vulnerability. This figure shows um, the, the basic concept where the increased vulnerability to flooding is caused by the subsidence of the land, the land's gone down, relative to a flood level. So there is a resulting um, increase in flood vulnerability to the land. What increased flood vulnerability does not include is flooding that occurred before the earthquake, because it's about uh, the change in flooding that resulted from the earthquake. 
does not cover increases in flooding due to changes in off-site drainage to, due to the earthquake, or increases in flooding due to changes in streams and rivers that are off-site. Uh, it doesn't cover, IFE does not cover local water ponding from frequent rainfall events, as this is covered by another category of land damage called Category 4, or ponding. In considering um, increased flood vulnerability, we have to have a way of assessing it. And so EQC have determined a number of criteria. The first one is that we assess the flooding in the 1 in 100 year annual exceedance probability, or the 1 in 100 or the 100 year return period flood. And we consider that for situations um, without temporary stop banks, without climate change, or without consideration of future development. And those things are because we're trying to determine the change in flood vulnerability from immediately prior to the earthquake to immediately after the earthquake. So future effects from climate change and future development don't need to be considered. Uh, we're only concerned with the increase in flood depth at the property, which must be due to ground subsidence at the property. And we've determined that the four major earthquakes that we should consider, because these four earthquakes resulted in the changes to the land, were the September 2010 and the February, June and December 2011 earthquakes. This diagram outlines our assessment process, and I'll talk to parts of this process in subsequent slides, but we have the criteria, which I talked to in the previous slide. We use those criteria to um, run flood models to determine flood depths and to determine how the flood depth changed um, after each of the earthquakes. We process that information uh, using some thresholds and then we go to a phase where we use um, engineering review based on some site-specific assessments so every property is looked at, and then final engineering review when we look at areas collectively and determine uh, where all the flooding that we've assessed is, increased flooding that we've assessed is appropriate or not. So the IFV assessment is determined from flood models. These flood models take into account the rainfall intensity and runoff of that rain from the from the rainfall um, onto the land and the accumulation in overland flow paths. We model the rivers and drainage uh, channels. The topography is measured by LIDAR, which is a um, survey that's been measured from the air using LIDAR, laser, lasers, sorry. And we consider tidal conditions. The catchments in Christchurch that we're considering um, in this work, and we build the models around, are of course the three main catchments of the sticks, Avon and Heathcote. And we also consider how the extreme sea levels around the Heathcote, Avon, Avon Heathcote estuary um, affect the, the, the areas that fringe the estuary but are outside the three main catchments or the two main catchments that discharge the estuary. Just a little bit on LIDAR. So LIDAR, as I mentioned before, is the process where from an aircraft uh, laser, um, lasers are pointed at the ground at rapid frequency and they, from, the, from, the, from that laser return to the aircraft, the height of the land is determined. These LIDAR surveys were flown after each of the major earthquakes and we compare back to uh, a pre-September 2010 set of LIDAR surveys. In our flood modelling, we use the surveys at each of these points in times, before the earthquake and then after each of the four earthquakes to determine how the flooding changed after each of the earthquakes. The other information that we use is um, survey cross-sections of all the main rivers and watercourses in Christchurch. When, you, when we consider uh, the LIDAR and look at how 
the land levels have changed from before the earthquake sequence to after the earthquake sequence. This is the summary pattern we have. So you can see that the main features, um, the, the Avon River in particular stands out. And, and the legend and the coloration is, is the change in ground levels. So where uh, the areas in pink uh, that are adjacent to the Avon uh, have the greatest changes in, in elevation. And so those are, are that colour pink is between 0.5 and 1 metres. The area of green here is an area of uplift, so the Heathcote Valley and areas um, in that vicinity uh, and the adjacent port hills went up in the earthquake sequence. The, the models have been um, tested through um, sensitivity testing and through validation against uh, observed flooding. The flood event from the 4th and 5th of March um, has been um, used as a validation event and this figure shows on, on the left what the observed flooding was for the 4th and the 5th of March event and the right hand panel shows the modelled flooding. Uh, there is good correlation, there is good representation from, from in the model flooding of the observed flooding. In some areas the, the model, model actually shows some flooding uh, where it seemingly wasn't observed but that was because uh, at the time of the floods the observers who were taking the measurements could only be um, in some locations and couldn't be everywhere so that the absence of flooding in the observed um, figure here doesn't mean that the flooding didn't occur, it's just it wasn't recorded. To, to assess whether increased flooding vulnerability uh, is, meets the criteria, we apply a, a number of thresholds. The first one is that the flood depth has increased by 200 mils as a result of the on-site land subsidence and that's overall. The second is that the flood depth has increased by 100 mils or more as a result of the on-site land subsidence in any one of the four earthquake events. Also that the land has suffered observed land damage as a result of the Canterbury earthquake sequence. And thirdly, and finally, and this is considered not by Tonkin and Taylor as engineers but by the valuers, whether the change in flood vulnerability has caused the value of the property to decrease. So all of these thresholds are measured against the 1% or the 1 in 100 year <coughs> of flood event. Once we've done that assessment, we undertake engineering review. At the end of the assessment, customers have, are advised whether they're potential IFE or not. But then we under, undertake an engineering review where we go uh, every identified property is looked at um, in detail by our engineers using all the information that's available to them and including a site visit to determine whether it will qualify as potential IFE to be passed to the valuers and on to EQC. As an as a, as a additional step we undertake a final engineering review where all those individual properties are looked at um, spatially ac across a suburb to identify whether, whether there's any gaps or, or um, any properties that should be reconsidered. And all of this is um, to confirm um, whether we're identifying IFE to, to the best of our ability and using all of, the, all of the information sources we have. So this is really a summary slide of the increased flooding vulnerability process. I described the, the data um, and the data sources. These are used to drive the flood models to determine uh, where flooding occurs in the one in a hundred year event. We then uh, undertake an assessment process where we use those thresholds to determine whether increased flood vulnerability has occurred. Uh, the customers uh, receive a letter from the Earthquake Commission and, and then uh, we continue with our work with the engineering reviews 
Um, once we, as engineers, have determined that um, we consider that increased flood vulnerability has occurred on the, on the site, the valuers um, uh, uh, make an assessment. Uh, there is an additional step in the process uh, or an additional consideration for the Earthquake Commission, the declaratory judgment process where the Earthquake Commission are seeking a decision from the, from the High Court as to whether the process that's been developed by the Earthquake Commission um, meets all the appropriate tests and subject to that declaratory judgment and the decision, the settlements will be made to all the land claimants.